Hello everybody, um, welcome to this Transport Tavern, another Transport Tavern. So first of all, we'll do the usual uh, check. Uh, can everybody hear me? Lewis, you can hear me, can't you? I can indeed. Yes, so can, can someone just say if you can hear us, both of us, please, just to make sure. I can see a lot of people I know in the room. Come on, one of you, please. Oh, I forget it's slightly behind. Yes, thank you, Peter and Andrew. Thank you very much. So, welcome everybody to the Transport Tavern on this, well, it's the 3rd of August, and I'm very, very happy to welcome my friend and academic colleague, Lewis Smith. Welcome, Lewis, to the Transport Tavern. Hello, and thank you very much for having me on. So, uh, you've got a slide that's a bit about you, so we'll do the bit about you first, and then we'll talk about drinks. How's that sound? Yeah, that works for me. Okay, let's go to the PowerPoint screen. Oh, no, wrong. Well, you'll get next week. But So, so <laughs> tell, ev tell everybody a little about you so yourself. Okay, so, um, yeah, I've, I've got lo lots, lots to nerd out in this presentation. Um, so my name's Lewis. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Essex. Um, and my current PhD thesis, which has been brand new titled, um, I've called it, and actually I don't think my supervisors know that I've retitled, so that may be a conversation that happens afterwards, <laughs> um, has been recently titled as Midwife at Britain's Rebirth, the British Overseas Airways Corporation and the Projection of British Power. Um, so uh, that's something we're going to dig into today. Yeah. Um, but I'd be lying if I said that was sort of my only interest. Um, as as you well know, David, um, I'm very very interested in British Rail. Well, absolutely. <laughs> that's my uh, that's my productive procrastination. I think I call it. Yeah, um, I can get on board with that. <laughs> uh, but I also do bits and pieces on Marconi. Uh, I've done a little bit on Train Simulator as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully, that'll be coming out relatively soon. Um, and generally, I'm, I just love modern, modern British history, uh, particularly oh. marketing and representation. Yeah, I mean, I will direct everybody to um, your paper on, uh, on sort of gender and the marketing of British Rail, uh, which is excellent. And I think we can say it won a little award, didn't it? It might have done, yeah. <laughs> Go on, don't be, don't be shy. Don't be uh, modest. Tell everybody about the award. Uh, yes, it won the um, the John Scholes Prize uh, yeah. for the Journal of Transport History. Yeah, um, it's really excellent paper, and uh, I recommend everybody go and have a look at it. So then we'll 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 do we'll do on the bar now. Should we do on the bar? Absolutely. So I'm drinking. I'm afraid I'm on the. One of these days I'm going to have a beer again, but the Dragonfly Earl Grey Redbush and Lewis is completely on brand here. Uh, explain, Lewis. Uh, so this is the, I can't actually say a lot of the history of it, um, but um, as part of British Airways' uh, recent birthday, um, they partnered with Brewdog to create Speedbird 100 IPA. Mm -hmm. um, and I happened to be strolling out of the archive one day and they were selling off all of their old stock. Um, so I carted... Uh, I think it was um, 12 cans back from uh, sort of all the way through London back to Colchester. Yeah. It's very uh, nice. It's, yeah, it's very, it's very good beer. Um, I, I, I had some through a source and uh, it's, it's, they, they're now actually reselling it on, on online, perhaps because British Airways doesn't have, have a use for it at the moment. So, but you enjoying it? It is absolutely wonderful. I'm not really a bitter fan, um, but that's got quite a nice. I believe it's grapefruit flavour yeah. in the background. Yeah, I think I think uh, that was my impression, or a very fruity uh, mm. thing. So um, before we get on with the main event, uh, I'm going to head over to this slide, which is uh, a call for papers um, that I and some colleagues put out. My colleagues being Mike Esperst. Uh, uh, Sophie Bora, Oli Betts and Erin Beeston and we are going to do a Twitter conference which is a two day Twitter conference on the 
new tracks in the history of railways and that's on the 17th and 18th of September but we're looking to have research on if you, if you want to submit an abstract and want to get involved uh, path breaking research on railway history uh, we're looking for that plurality and different perspectives so we want people social economic business you name it any perspectives and we want to invite contribution from academic and non-academic scholars to get involved and we, we, we're kind of looking for to engage with scholars who perhaps don't consider their work primarily as railway history or even transport history and get them we know there are plenty of people out there who have something to offer transport historians so we want to get people involved as many people involved and the format I don't know if you know you've seen a Twitter conference before it consists of 10 to 15 tweets maximum about 4,000 characters and can include links photographs gifs and videos and the deadline uh, for abstracts of 150 words is uh, on the 10th of August and the emails on your screen newtracksconf 2020 at gmail.com so that's yeah you've got about a week if you want to contribute um, and there's a, a, a list of you, it's on the, there is a uh, Twitter feed which I should have actually popped up but if you search on Twitter you'll find it but there's the list of subjects where we're looking well anything these ones and other relevant we're open to many ideas so these are just sort of you know what call for papers do they do other you know a list of things that will be considered plus other things of course so uh, do get involved so shall we get on with uh, the show so Lewis fantastic so the Speedbird okay. Heritage Centre tell us all Ah, uh, well this is um, this is one of my favourite places to be um, sort of fans of uh, aviation heritage really should check this out um, it's it's actually a little bit intimidating to get to um, because it's right in the middle of um, British Airways' headquarters in Harmonsworth uh, they call it the, the Waterside Centre um, and you go in and it's really really corporate um, and they've kind of got a lake going through their headquarters and just off that uh, lake um, is the Speedbird Heritage Centre um, and there's all sorts of BOAC, BEA, um, British Airways ephemera in there. Um, just to draw your attention to the picture um, on the... I'm, it's going to be really half my brain to work it out, but if, uh, if I can just draw your attention to the picture on the right, um, that's actually a repurposed Concord seat. Um, <laughs> right. And they've converted them into office chairs. Mm -hmm. um, extremely uncomfortable to work in. Extremely uncomfortable to work in. Uh, presumably because you're not meant to work in them. Um, but it's... Oh, I love I love just sitting there and rifling through old BA documents. Mm -hmm. um, quite often, actually, they have cabin crew graduations there as well. Um, so I'm sat quietly in the background and uh, all of BA's cabin crew are coming up to the front and collecting their awards. Uh, it's really quite interesting to hear how it all works. <laughs> cool. I. So you go there and you research Britain's state-owned airlines. So uh, yeah, tell us, tell us what what you're trying to say with this slide. And okay, so um, as with, uh, funny enough, most of the history I do kind of derives from. Um, the Second World War in some way. I mean, all of post-war history tends to uh, derive from the Second World War. Um, but in 1939, um, the British Overseas Airways Act merged two airlines together. Um, and that was um, Imperial Airways and, slightly confusingly, uh, British Airways. Um, but that's not the British Airways that we have today. This is a British Airways Limited. Um, and they are kind of compounded together to form the British Overseas Airways Corporation. Um, and they're done two months after the beginning of the Second World War. Um, and it's a Conservative government that does it. Um, and obviously it's, it's quite odd to hear a Conservative government nationalising things. Um, but it's done to sort of, it, to make aviation a utility uh, for the state. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to try and avoid talking about aviation during the Second World War um, for a couple of reasons. As firstly, because uh, it's been done to death, um, because it, it 
aviation during the Second World War, particularly civil aviation during the Second World War, um, is uh, it's been done countless times. Um, and also it's quite dull um, because it's generally just kind of capturing this airline as um, it is just a utility throughout the Second World War for just shuffling around people. Um, it generally doesn't perform a function better than that. Um, but immediately after the Second World War, you have a sweeping Labour victory um, who's determined to change everything up and make uh, make all of these services work for everyone. Um, and they instigate what's called the Swinton Plan. And this captures aviation very quickly as Britons. Um, so BOAC are split, or they, they divide up the aviation services into three. Um, so British Overseas Airways Corporation, British European Airways, uh, and the British South American Airways. Um, and these all serve different sectors. Um, so BEA serves Europe, so that's British European Airways. Um, that deals with everywhere in Europe. Um, British South American Airways, um, you probably guess where they serve, um, but they don't stick around for very long. They're very quickly brought into BOAC in 1949, I believe. Um, and eventually, uh, you get BOAC, which serves, and I quote, the com. Uh, just got a quote here. Um, they serve the Commonwealth and Atlantic routes, together with the ultimate extensions to China and the Far East. Uh, will be assigned to the British Overseas Airways Corporation. The corporation and their predecessor, Imperial Airways, have been responsible for the development and operation of these routes in the past. They are in close relations with the corresponding operators of Commonwealth countries. They are therefore clearly the appropriate instrument of this operation. Mm -hmm. um, so BOAC are pretty much coined there and then as the Commonwealth airline. Um, so two things kind of bundled together there. So BOAC are nationalized and they own routes. No one else can compete with them. Um, or certainly no other British airline can compete with them. Um, and secondly, um, they are pretty much the Commonwealth institution. And that is where BOAC derives. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, what's that part of, you know, because of course other state nationalized industries around this time, the railways being notable and of course the setting up of the NHS. What was the, you know, is, is how, how would you link it to those broader developments? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's captured under that, that Atlian spirit. I hate the word Atlian, it's a horrible word, but it's very much sort of after the devastation of the Second World War, um, after all of this mass destruction, um, that there are certain industries and certain services that should serve people out of a sense of duty and a sense of mm -hmm. honour rather than a sense of profit. Um, and BOAC, uh, much like the railways, um, they're transport utility. Um, and there's very much the belief in this period that transport shouldn't be a profit-making exercise, that it should very much be you know, you, sh you should operate a train or you should operate an aircraft because you should be connecting people. Mm. Um, it comes out of this fairly romantic view um, that transport is for everyone and it's kind of open to all. Mm. Should we move on to the next slide? Absolutely. So, yes, yeah, austerity aviation. Aviation. Absolutely. And there's... This is where you start getting. Well, this is certainly where the where you consider the the classic um, of the BOAC early ads. Um, the use of uh, some of the posters is phenomenal. Um, but obviously, um, a utility designed in this way, you know, it's designed to, for everyone. Um, it, it, in a, it in a in a sense, it is. Um, it's available to everyone. Um, but there is quite a cruel reality here. Um, that aviation is more of a plaything of the rich. Mm. Um, so, for example, I've got my stats here. Um, in 1947, a flight from London Airport, which you'll know now today as uh, Heathrow, um, to New York cost £145. Yeah. Uh, in today's money, that's £5,600. Um, so aviation is very much 
advertised as this uh, of the people thing, even though very, very few people actually manage to use it. Um, what, what, um, out of curiosity, what, what years are these posters, do you know? So these are, uh, both of these posters are between 45 and 50. Um, these are f later ones. I think they're 47. I think they're both used in 47. Because that's a very uh, modern aesthetic compared to, well, I can only compare it to some railway posters, but it's it's much more stylish and, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's one key thing missing, um, or there's that's a slight lie actually because there is one in the left picture um, but one big thing that's missing in this is they're not showing off flashy aircraft they're not showing off destinations they're not showing off crew they're not showing off service hmm. uh, they're not advertising a place or a, any service really what they're what they're saying they're more symbolic right. um, and they're very much going for you know BOAC are opening the world and there's okay. a potential of aviation and travel even if the reality is slightly less open than that um, very romantic belief. Okay, um, I got some observations. Um, at the time, uh, most flag carriers, sorry, thanks Barry, most flag carriers were state-owned, broadly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so David says, uh, designation of British airline of one British airline to operate on non-domestic routes, but especially long haul, was part of the so-called Bermuda Agreement between the UK and the USA in 1946. Yeah. What, what, can can you exp any thoughts on that? And... There are, I mean, there are there are loads of different agreements that come into play in this period. There's, and it's very much a lot of these agreements are very much gentlemen's agreements mm -hmm. uh, and that they're sort of they're, they're trying to be politically symbolic and they're trying not to step on each other's toes um, particularly along the transatlantic route that breaks apart very quickly as we go later on down the line mm -hmm. um, and particularly when you start getting different um, nationalities of aircraft come in as well um, so that's something we'll kind of naturally dig into as we go on Okay, well, if uh, yeah, if you're going to dig into it, uh, then uh, should we move on to the the next? Absolutely, it's up, it's up to you. It's up to you. Well, just just to mention the other image there, so I've completely forgotten that. Um, one thing that the that BOAC really stand for in this time period is royalty, um, and there's a real association with the Queen in particular. Obviously, there isn't the Queen until 1952. Um, but BOAC were very much the royal airline. Mm. Um, so they would shuffle the king backwards and forwards over Commonwealth trips. There are loads of images of the king descending aircraft with BOAC at the top. Um, it's very much captured as a royal affair. Yeah. Um, obviously, that that's partly, you know, because there are no other aviation assets that could be used. Um, and it makes sense to use the flag carrier. Mm -hmm. um, but there is also a, quite an important uh, symbology there that, again, will kind of emerge as we go through, um, and that BOAC becomes more and more this national power symbol, just as royalty are. Okay. I imagine um, it'd be interesting not asking, you know, <laughs> to comment on whether the same uh, aesthetic is projected with the railways, from my point of view as a railway historian so yeah absolutely yeah i'm not sure it has the same impact anyway uh on to the next one world leadership now this this is this is my favorite uh boac story um so this is the de havilland comet this is the dh106 um so from you go from the 1940s which are filled with um, almost gloom of so much austerity. People need a symbol to look up to. Um, as obviously Britain is struggling at this point. Britain is not doing particularly well economically. It's a slow build. Um, rationing is still in place. Um, so clever people at de Havilland uh, decide to merge together two different ideas. They merge together um, a jet. Oh, they merge together an airliner. So something which flies and carries lots of people 
with a wartime technology called the jet engine. Um, and this uh, comes together as the de Havilland Comet. Um, it's sleek. Uh, it looks like no, nothing aviation has ever seen before. Um, it's got no propellers. It's particularly curvy. Um, I can't remember which historian described it like this, um, but one of them described uh, the comet as aviation pornography. Um, and it becomes right. this symbol of leadership. Um, and it's very much ahead of America. You don't get to uh, jet aviation until the late 1950s. Again, something we'll see in a second. Um, but the comet is the symbol of Britain's strength abroad. And it's captured in these ads um, where Britain is the world leader. Um, words come out like dominant. Um, in the BOAC review, the in-house newsletter, they describe it as it's far more than just a faster aeroplane. It has become a symbol to people abroad of Britain's resumption of leadership in world progress. Everywhere we, everywhere we went, crowds of important officials, as well as, pub, as well as the public, came to see this new British achievement. So it kind of centres the world once again on Britain. Um, and you'll see why that's particularly powerful um, in the next slide. Um, okay. But it's an absolutely fascinating aircraft that we'll come back to later on. Is it the help for other airlines? Absolutely. So this this is where my PhD starts uh, digging around um, some of the perhaps perhaps darker avenues um, of the British Overseas Airways Corporation. Um, so this was an article published in 1963. Um, don't worry about the fact that it's published in 63 for now. Um, what matters is it's a retrospective account of all of the airline's actions. Um, and fabulous language here. Um, the current chairman describes, um, and I'll quote this, it's a bit of a lengthy quote, but it's an important one. Um, other British airlines have played their part in the growth of Commonwealth aviation, but Imperial Airways and BOAC have done the most to answer the call first made at the Imperial Conference in 1922 for the establishment of air communications to and within the British Empire and Commonwealth. And my favourite quote, and certainly no other airline has been midwife at the birth of so many other airlines as BOAC. Now, that really captures... BOAC's role in the world they're not just the Commonwealth airline they're the Commonwealth midwife um, and uh, as was pointed out you, you've got many state owned carriers here um, and what you have is BOAC in a sense trying to build up everyone else's state owned carrier um, and they become very much um, interlinked with a network of various different um, airlines that are old Commonwealth and Imperial airlines. Um, and there's very much sort of an empire and control system going on. And you can see that in the comet on the, uh, on the right. Um, it, it's an East African Airways jet. And yes, it's a comet for, um, for anyone in the audience that notices that. Yeah, I'm slightly out of my time period. But technically it counts. Um, the Comet is in exactly the same design as a BOAC Comet. And that design, the blue strip that goes down the middle and the text written in exactly that font is pretty much universal across BOAC's um, associate and subsidiary airlines. Mm -hmm. So it's almost branding the Commonwealth as one single aviation entity, even though that masks some of the more complicated ideas. Yeah. Um, but there's a real power symbol here. And, um, I mean, you might talk about this. So if I ask a question, you're going to talk about it, just let me know. But is it the case that the transition from empire to commonwealth, how, 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 would, how would that be interpreted? Or what was the interrelation with that, do you think? So there's, uh, it, it's a weird one. Um, I, we will kind of dig into some of the some of the the darker aspects of that in a couple more slides, okay. but just generally, um, there's very much a sense here that 
as the British Empire is struggling, as the British Empire is very slowly declining, um, BOAC symbolises it as if nothing's wrong. Mm. And BOAC have still got this vast network of cooperative airlines um, and it's still supporting all of these airlines. So it's, it's very much that romantic image that BOAC are holding the Commonwealth together. Yeah. But again, that masks so many realities. Yeah. Okay. Um, should we... Ah, oh, well. Yes. So this is the... I, I deliberately wanted to put a break between saying how great the Comet 1 was uh, and how bad the Comet 1 was. Um, so I've labelled this slide forecasting Britain's decline. Um, back when I was an undergraduate, however many years ago that was, um, my dissertation was on the Comet crashes. Um, so there, there's got to be some kind of eerie predictions of history going on. Um, I've deliberately assembled props, um, but in the excellent uh, No Highway by Neville Shute, I don't know whether that's actually visible at all. Right, uh, let, me, let me play uh, that. Okay, ooh. there we go. Fab, absolutely fabulous book. Um, but it's, it sound, it's got the worst tagline ever, as it's about uh, metal fatigue. Uh, it's a story about metal fatigue. Um, which I can't imagine sells particularly well. Um, but in it, an aircraft engineer um, suspects that after a while, metal breaks and fractures. Um, and he's investigating an aircraft called the Reindeer. Um, and he has to fly over to Canada to have a look at the wreckage, not realizing that he's actually on a reindeer. Um, so he's panicking as the right as a certain amount of hours ticks by, the plane might or might not explode. Um, Neville Shute wrote that book in 19, I believe 1948, um, which very much precedes what happens with the comet. Um, now, the comet had various different issues. First of all, with a jet aircraft, you're going a lot faster. You need to, you need to time more specifically when you're pulling up. So there are several uh, pilot-induced accidents that happen of comets sliding off runways, um, one of which kills six people on board. Um, but after a while, after those issues kind of iron out, um, suddenly, um, and just to check my records, because I always mix up these crashes because there's so many, um, the comet GALYV, uh, Suddenly, upon crash, uh, upon taking off from Calcutta, I have got that correct, haven't I? Yes. Uh, so it takes off from Calcutta and suddenly explodes. Um, it's just seen as an engineering accident. It's not great, but it's just seen as another problem. Um, and then another aircraft crashes under the same circumstances in South Africa. Um, literally just dissolves on takeoff. Then it happens again in Rome. Um, obviously, because the comet's so uh, captured as this symbol of power, um, there are several dodgy cover-ups about what it might be. So you've got things from bomb threats, you've got sabotage. Um, I believe they even direct sabotage at the Americans as well, blaming America for being jealous of Britain's jet lead. Um, Last, very last on the list is that there might be a flaw. Um, I, I'm really nerding out about the comet. It's one of my favourite things ever. Um, as you can see on that image of the window, as it turns out, um, the comet had square windows, which meant that at the corner of those windows, um, pressure would build, and after a certain amount of hours, it would just explode. Hmm. Um, so as it turns out, the comet is why we have circular windows on aircraft. Um, important engineering lesson. Um, but obviously these crashes are um, fairly damaging on Britain's international reputation. Um, and it becomes very much a sore issue. I mean, so if we sort of think about the funding of the comet and, and who's behind it, I mean, could, 
uh, remind me it's of the manufacturer yeah so de Havilland uh, of were they're, they're, de Havilland's famous aircraft before the Comet was the Mosquito yeah uh, and that major symbol of Britain's um, aerial warfare capability what was the what was the so was it all, any government investment at all any government sort of uh, backing for the the project and, and hence why they might be you know it might be even more embarrassing yeah absolutely the, the government do um, I don't think the government funding is too much but where the government get involved and it and it's particularly embarrassing is that the government encourage, uh, in inverted commas, BOAC to take charge of this aircraft. Right. Um, and BOAC are the, the first aircraft to operate a comet, and they are, are seen as almost deserving of that. Mm -hmm. um, and BOAC, therefore, have to pick up on all of the extra costs. They're therefore responsible for all of the pilot errors that occur. Um, so it's... Uh, government do also invest some money, um, but it's not nearly as much as the the heart that BOAC invest. Yeah. Um, and especially when you, if you look over their annual reports, um, there are some real broken hearts um, in the 53, 54, 55 annual reports. It really is devastating that these comets go down. Yeah. I well, in many many ways, isn't it? Um... I, I I think it's it's. You say you you put here forecast in Britain's decline. I mean, is is that the sense? I mean, wh why did you put that? I mean. I mean that that's my that's my fascination really is um, that I I I really like seeing how um, issues like this become part of the national consciousness, hmm. um, and very much the. The advent of the comet is seen as Britain returning from its decline. Um, you know, it's succeeding from the damage of the war, um, and this very much captures the spirit of the decline, which is um, brought about by authors in the '60s. Right. Um, so people use the comet as an example of Britain's decline, um, and that's very much how it feels, or that's very much how it felt at the time. Yeah. So David has commented, "Cone of silence." is a 1960 film which described the issues with unexplained crashes of British passenger aircraft. It has parallels to the Comet disasters. Absolutely. Absolute classic film as well. Highly recommend it. Yeah. Um, but you do you get that spur of culture as well, that, um, that fear of aircraft disasters almost emanates from this point. Mm. Okay. I mean, how much... How, how often were these i mean how many were there do you do you know um i think there were in the region of um there were three yeah, i'm gonna get my numbers wrong here i think there were four explosive hull losses right. so that's four comets that literally just dissolve in the air um and there's two or three pilot error crashes right. at which point all of the comets become grounded yeah. um none of them fly um but as we as we move on through to like the comet four, uh, actually figure slightly increases um, as you right. go forward. Shall we uh, head to the next one? Absolutely. So this is a classic. Um, I also partly apologise for the amount of aircraft, um, but hopefully that's uh, satisfying to the the transport tavern. Um, well, I mean, I, I've been putting loads of pictures of trains, so <laughs> you know. I should have found the, I should have found the opportunity to put in a train here. Uh, I feel I'm really missing that. Well, you know, can't have everything, eh? <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely a project somewhere in there about the BOAC do a lot of operations with the Victoria um, Rail Link. Uh, that becomes really, oh, really? big. Um, and BOAC are really, I think they BOAC might even sponsor some of that rail link. And there's definitely something in there. I haven't worked out what it is, but there's something in there. Okay. So the Jet Age Take Two. Absolutely. So this is the Boeing 707. Um, mm -hmm. And this was a very, very successful aircraft. Um, with one exception in that it was built by America. 
Um, and after a lot of, uh, shall we say, badgering the government, um, they are finally allowed to purchase um, American 707s, and it is seen as a massive betrayal of Britain. Um, one MP testified in the Commons, the foreigner believes that the policy of British nationalised industries is inspired and endorsed by Her, Her Majesty's government. This practice is developing of nationalised industries, purchasing large quantities of expensive engineering equipment and now aircraft overseas, um, is undermining British industrial prese prestige overseas, affecting our export trade and having a very adverse effect, adverse effect on our prospects. Um, it is devastating. Um, and it's political dynamite um, for people, uh, for the, the sitting government at the time, the Conservatives, who are investing money in independent airlines, um, who want to discourage BOAC's monopoly on all of their routes. Um, it's seen as your nationalised industries are letting you down, um, and you should be you should feel hurt by the fact that they've purchased American 707s. Mm. Um, and they very much try, they spend a lot of their try time trying to not necessarily justify, but trying to maximise the Britishness of the 707. Um, so, as you see on the ad there, um, after a couple of years, they add Rolls-Royce engines. So now, right. it's not all American, it's just mostly American. And they, okay. they really capture Rolls-Royce um, as this... Um, look at us, we're supporting British industry um, you, can't, you can't be mad at us for doing this um, it's fascinating to see that behaviour mm. I mean, to what extent is there a sort of a tension there between BOAC which needed to operate as a, a commercial entity, needed to remain solvent and you know make profits even and is that, that uh, and that sort of the, the the symbolism of BOEC is is that a, a tension that you see all the way through its existence? Yeah, absolutely. In in fact, through certainly through most of its existence, um, notably the point where it's at its best, um, where it's cooperative with the government is um, Attlee's government up to fifty one. As mm. soon as Attlee loses power, um, aviation starts well certainly well, that's slightly unfair um boac begin having to fight their corner a bit more um because again you have the the foundations the labor party trying to um offer aviation as this service it's helping the world it's not just helping britain it's helping the entire planet build um create other airlines but obviously that wasn't very cost effective so as soon as the conservatives gain power they're trying to cut costs. And BOAC's yeah. operations that are very much for the world aren't particularly... They're not very good with money at this stage. So what money right. they do get, they have to invest in Britain. Again, and that's why you have that tension with the American purchase, because it's seen as not just rejecting Britain's aircraft, um, but it's, it's almost rejecting Britain because you're because they then go and invest their money in America um, but again it's that tension between do you keep commercially active or do you sit and wait until Britain comes up with their own plane yeah I suppose for a lot of people as we discussed it, 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 it's linked to that sense of decline that some people had absolutely and again that's where you get the I, I'm adamant this is partly where you get the idea that nationalized industries represent decline um, not because they, um, not because they actually do, but because the actions they're forced to take um, make them easily attacked as sort of anti-British um, mm. traitors of um, Britain. Whereas actually, you know, they're doing the best of what they have. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose in some ways, being an airline, the, the BOC, and I'm thinking out of the top of my head here, they're more susceptible to that. Because unlike the railways where there's fixed infrastructure, it's quite, you know, it, there's a lot of British, everything's pretty much British on British railways because of that international dimension, because planes aren't bounded by infrastructure in the same way. Uh, the aer aeroplane is perhaps more 
more symbolic of because it is an international de- traveler as it were yeah absolutely i mean i mean there's there's a kind of a, a couple of a uh, couple of things in that um in that um so first of all when you when britain invents the comet um you find that there are suddenly um large injections of funding into old colonial airports to hmm. bring them up to and i believe it is a phrase comet standards um so very much it's it's not just it, it's the symbol the symbolism of the comet as an empire thing um and you know this development thing as well um but yeah because I, I i frequently have that thought between the difference between what, what is the difference between railways and aviation um the only kind of the only intrinsic difference is that um aviation serves this international purpose mm. whereas the railways serve very much a domestic purpose so it's almost yeah. seen as worse a bigger betrayal that um this fundamentally british airline a flying american planes it's yeah. it's that sense of betrayal that really is behind the 707 mm-hmm. should we head on to the next one absolutely Comet take two. Absolutely. So um, the comet doesn't entirely disappear. Um, it's reworked almost fundamentally. Um, its windows are made more round, um, and several other, uh, shall we say, quality of life adjustments were made. And it becomes the Comet Four. Um, that's partly because the Comet Two and the Comet Three were, I think, they were in line when the Comet One was being sold. Um, and they had to be quietly swept under the rug. Um, but the Comet One, uh, Comet Four comes along, and what a brave decision it was to keep the Comet name. Um, I mean, some would say brave, others would say fairly foolish. Um, but the Comet keeps up its record of breaking, uh, uh, breaking uh, international records. Um, so it becomes the first jetliner to cross the Atlantic. Um, because no other jetliner had done it at the time. It beats the 707. Um, And it's also the first aircraft to completely circumnavigate the world. Um, Not not at once, um, because its range was terrible. Um, But in doing short hops, it's the first aircraft to do one route all the way around the world. Uh, And it's very much celebrated as that. But that's not what comes through in the marketing. one of my favourite ads ever is BOAC is not only the Comet. Um, obviously, the angle they're trying to go for there is, you know, it's it's about the service, it's about the destinations. Um, but I read that as, look, guys, the, the Comet era is done. We're more than that. Um, and I think yeah. that very much captures that sense um, that certainly the press felt about Britain's uh, about BOAC's betrayal of Britain. Right. I mean, this is the era, I mean, we might get to this in a bit, but this is the era when there's more international travel, isn't there? Mm. And to what extent was that shift towards destination marketing about changing or, or as an alter, uh, changing consumption patterns? And they, they frame that that also perhaps frames it, do you think? Yeah, I mean, that that does that does frame the change as well. Like that's um, an extremely important thing. Um, but BOAC keep up aircraft marketing for a very, very long time. Right. Okay. It still remains, I think even the 70s and 80s, even, you have a real focus on planes. Um, and to be honest, I don't really know why. Um, because as the world shifts to, um, as it becomes more globalised, um, you'd think that it would focus more on destination marketing. Yeah. But it doesn't. It, they keep with the plane and I think again running through the minds of all of the uh, chairman at the time is that they need to emphasize their Britishness um, mm. but again that, that's an inefficient practice and that's another thing people highlight as to the failure of nationalized industry okay again I feel like I'm being quite mean to nationalized industry it's like I was <laughs> in my history indoors talk but um, that's kind of the sense that's captured yeah, and I mean it's an important 
whether you know we could argue debate people could debate the sort of finer points of the engineering or management or whatever but the how 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 organizations project themselves is 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 really important in that discourse that discussion isn't it yeah absolutely or even in fact how the press decide to represent a, com a company absolutely yeah, yeah. sometimes they don't even get a choice <laughs> well indeed so oh so we moved on a little vc tenderness absolutely my favorite well one of my i've got a lot of favorites um it's because i've been doing this phd for far too long um so this is the vc10 this is the successor to the comet that doesn't have the comet name so you can't blame them for carrying on with inefficient practices um except uh it was still uh it was a fabulous running aircraft um, I say to this day, that's actually incorrect, but um, up until 2019, I think this aircraft held the subsonic speed record. Um, right. It was the fastest ever subsonic flight ever um, until 2019 when in Storm Kira, um, a 747 overtook it. Um, but this was um, basically a cobble together of all of the military projects that were going on at the time. Um, this is also embroiled in a lot of Cold War controversy. Um, it's something that I've only recently found out, um, but it's definitely something I want to dig into. Um, it's suspiciously similar to the uh, the IL-62 uh, Russian long-haul jetliner. Um, as you can see the difference on those two pictures there. Yeah, they, they do look pretty similar don't they absolutely and there's this massive debate about whether it's been uh, whether there's been corporate espionage going on um, and there's very much a again it's Britain being undermined by the rest of the world and it so, so, the so the Russians are alleged to have taken it from the British or the other way around so primarily um, the British believe that their idea was stolen right um, okay but obviously, I, I think it was a bit tit for tat in that sense. Um, commentators called it the VC Tensky, which I thought was brilliant. Hmm. So what? I mean, how much of a leap forward was this? Um, very much. Well, again, it depends. It depends how you look at it. it this was. Um, a revolution in all senses. Everything was redesigned. Um, so, for example, the engines at the back were sold as a, a way of um, making the cabin quieter. Um, its range was um, obscene. It could do much further than any other air aircraft. Um, and particular, uh, in particular, um, and this kind of relates to the next slide, but um, this becomes very much a symbol of dominance yet again um, yeah. this aircraft was designed specifically to operate um, under uh, hot conditions and particularly dry conditions um, and becomes captured in um, a dominance of Africa and I have no idea why this is something I'd like to dig into even further um, but again it becomes symbolised in this power struggle the, um, the developing commonwealth and that sort of idea of drawing the Commonwealth together? Yeah, absolutely. Um, perhaps even more cynical than that. Um, as you see, um, in fact, shall we move on to the next slide, yeah, actually, because that ties in quite nicely. Um, so you begin, well, I say you begin, um, this is kind of an evolution. Um, it be You become, uh, BOC become more aggressive about their about how they emphasise Britain in this time. Um, annoyingly, I haven't chosen a VC-10 um, image of that, um, but the VC-10 becomes part of African development. Um, and there are some absolutely horrifying recounts of how BOAC discussed the idea of uh, developing Africa. Um, as one of the big critics of the time, uh, Anthony Sampson wrote, um, that the chairman had to keep the Commonwealth linked um, with all of the other Commonwealth airlines, that no other major airline in the world had such a duty of obligation. So 
in so doing, they had to advertise fairly unpopular destinations. Again, so you do get that blur into destination marketing, but it's not mm. nearly as strong as it should have been. Um, so, for example, um, a, uh, a recount from the uh, BOAC review, uh, someone said it was strange that scarcely one day's flight from London to be seeing a near nude young black girl run out from a mud house. Um, so it becomes, the world becomes th very much this obscure and strange place, but one that you should see. Um, again, representations um, as very much a tribalism in Africa. Um, aircraft, uh, as the left mo most picture shows, um, the comet is, or the Comet 4 is put in this symbolism of Britain's technical majesty um, next to the lesser developed nations. Um, and it very much becomes this symbol of strength. And the worst policy I can, well, they're all pretty awful policies. Um, but uh, BOAC instigate uh, the uh, specific hiring of Asian women um, to make, um, to, well, to more easily market the Asian routes. Um, so they take over um, from British mm -hmm. cabin crew when the aircraft reaches Asia. Um, again, th they argue that's to make it more, more comfortable for Asian businessmen um, but there's various different other marketing materials that suggest otherwise um, that seem to suggest the, the Orient as this place of sort of um, sexual liberation. And it gets very, very strange um, in how they choose to market um, Asia in this sense. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, how did this tie in with sort of how the public or they were sold these destinations by other if you know other organizations or would was he were these common things that um holiday companies say did this wasn't a this wasn't a particularly uncommon occurrence um obviously the, there's still great strides in post-war britain there's, there's still a lot of problems with race um there's still a lot of tensions with race post-war era um, but what's different about BOAC is how aggressive they're tackling it um, when looking through some of the um, adverts for um, this one specifically aimed at Africa um, and it's very much it's it's described in a way that's bringing Africa up out of the dirt right. um, and it, it seemed to imply it's basically I, I argue that that's Cold War propaganda that this is used to make Britain as a whole seem much more altruistic to, to make it more positive in the world um, particularly when you have a lot of um, African nations rebelling um, and gaining independence in the 60s um, I think there's a real a real power struggle here between BOAC being kicked out of these African places and yet still having to market them. Right. Okay. I mean, it's it's interesting that I think it was Peter Lyth, I heard him talk about the idea how these, I mean, how these the, the countries that gained uh, their independence around this time would set up their own small, uh, you know, aircraft, you know, uh, in their own national flag carrying airline. Uh, I mean, is there any, you know, is there a sort of, is that a point of tension with BOAC at all, or how how did that work into play with? Actually, usually, um, the airline, or you're absolutely right. So lots of African nations do start developing their own, um, their own national flag carriers, but behind most of them is BOAC. Right. Um, very often, you see um, BOAC owning. 25, 30, 35 percent of the shares. Um, quite often they'll provide some very British looking aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, they'll offer specific training. Um, they'll offer grants to upgrade African airports. And this is all after independence. So there's very much a, a subtle growth towards a new sort of empire. Yeah. 
I think that's just fascinating to see that through a company. Mm -hmm. Should we head uh, on to the next slide? Absolutely. The burden of modernity. We're uh, going for a while, so um, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's great. Um, burden on modernity. Now that looks so, like Concord. Sort it of. is indeed. Um, it's one of my one of my proudest finds in the um, Speedbird Heritage Centre. Um, that I showed someone that knew aviation and immediately said, "Oh yeah, no, everyone knows about that." Um, but it's a com it's a Concorde in BOAC livery. Hmm. I'd never seen it before. I was so proud of myself for finding it, <laughs> and apparently it'd been online for ages. But anyway, um, yeah, throughout all of these discussions, obviously you have a lot of competition with America. You have a lot of that resent that um, America is making money off BOAC and throughout all of this period you have the Concorde project building um, it's the supersonic airliner that can travel um, twice three times the speed of sound um, and the achievement that that would bring to Britain would be absolutely impossible to measure um, except it's obviously uh, there's a lot of politics behind its building. Um, so this is where you see that tension between um, the government not wanting BOAC to invest tons of money in brand new planes that don't work, and yet telling them to invest money in this. Um, and this is where you get a lot of tensions. Um, and obviously the Concorde itself isn't British. Well, not wholly British. It yeah. becomes a project between the British and the French. But that in itself almost captures the direction. Um, the last British, um, well, BOAC's last British own aircraft was the VC 10. Right. Um, and the Concorde is very much just symbolism. It's not about business, it is just symbolism. Yeah. Um, and obviously, BOAC never actually operate the Concorde as well. Um, so all of this is just trying to build BOAC's reputation as this ultra British airline. Right. Okay. And is that in any way? Uh, do you see in the sort of thinking of BOAC a sort of break with? Is this considered a break with the past or a development of their sort of organisational trajectory? That's an interesting question. I. I think that this, I think the Concorde is almost, it's it's one of their projects that should supersede money. You see it with early on with the Comet, hmm. that in a lot of early discussions, it's we shouldn't be thinking about the commercial value because that doesn't matter. Uh, we should be thinking about the prestige value. Um, and you see it with the Comet and you only see it with one other aircraft, which is this one. Um, so it's it's weird because it occupies almost both spaces in that there's a there's a tension bet between having to operate it um, yeah I, yeah and, and, and it's symbolism it is, it's such a it's brand new but it's the same old logic yeah. basically I think it's what I'm going for So the move, move to the masses, so from the 60s and 70s, or...? Absolutely, so we're, we're now late 60s, early 70s. Um, and uh, actually this is sadly poignant as BA have recently retired um, all of their 747s. Um, but BOAC then start looking in the other direction. So rather than um, very fast travel, how can we move more and more people? Um, and obviously, as you know, this this brings down the cost of flying to appallingly cheap levels, and it becomes finally aviation becomes something that everyone can do. Um, and the seven uh, seven four seven is very much that's very much the seven four seven's philosophy. Um, except even that has its own problems, um, as it gets uh, BOAC received their seven four seven uh, in nineteen seventy, I believe. Um, yeah, so they receive it in 1970, 
Um, but it takes them a whole year before they can negotiate with the pilots that they can actually fly it. Um, so actually, and I also won't lie, um, uh, my expertise uh, on the 747 is fairly limited, um, but um, even that, BOAC don't really have for very long. Hmm. Um, so even then, BOAC still has this kind of um, elite nationalist um, power symbol right up until its privatization in the mid 70s right i mean how how did this sort of correlate with or you know with the rise of say uh package holidays and and things like that because wasn't international regulation if i recall developing over this period about sort of how things fly where things fly and things you know yeah, absolutely. Um, and you have, uh, and BOAC are selling package holidays. Um, I believe they're an early 60s thing, but uh, don't quote me on that. I'm not really an expert on the, the tourism side itself. Um, but very much, um, it's kind of captured with the 747, this idea of mass travel, hmm. uh, even though the reality is quite different. Um, I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, what what's the competition for BOC this time? It, it, isn't the market much more, again, if I recall, isn't it much more liberal at this time, liberalised? Yeah, absolutely. So BOAC's monopoly begins to end um, as conservative governments go on and on. Um, so I believe we're looking at the mid-1960s when it's finally decided that BOAC are no longer allowed to have... A monopoly on a route, so now other private British operators can uh, can work on it, um, and that is some of the BOAC reactions are brilliant. At how angry they are! They're going to contest every single airline, mm. invest hundreds and thousands of pounds in preventing other airlines from taking over those routes. Um, but yeah, BOAC start kind of fading into the background with these other airlines yeah. because they're really not prepared for competition. Yeah, I I mean, it it's it's interesting that I think that you know that competitive environment might you know they're not really ready for it and and they they don't take it in their stride when they've had. Do you think that's because they were so dominant or that they had a dominance for so long? Yeah, I I I, I think it's part of the culture of. The, the culture of uh, sort of the, the highest levels of management of BOAC because for so long they operate under the impression that BOAC is a national well I mean it is a national airline yeah. but BOAC's role of a national airline is symbolic it's not commercial yeah. and I think that's why they struggle so hard towards the end of their life to just to comprehend the idea that others are trying to compete with them yeah. Because it, it really is a it really is a culture shock that other British airlines are competing with BOAC because it, it, it seem it's almost like they can't understand why. Yeah. And that really comes through in how they refer to the independent airlines. Is there is there also a thing because we've been talking about how they flew to destinations like uh, you know in within the Commonwealth is it the case that you know one of the trends in this period is of course the rise of uh, tourism to spain and, and places within uh within europe so it's southern europe where there's a a, a growth in holiday making there and their their roots and structures are not really set up like do you need such, i don't know but do you need such a big plane for that market as see that see this Actually, that's a really important point because that's one thing I'm missing in this whole presentation. In fact, that's one thing I'm missing in my whole PhD um, is that I'm only talking about BOAC um, who are struggling in this global market. But the other state-owned airline at the time, British European Airways, is doing extremely well. Yeah. Um, the idea of traveling to Europe becomes a much more appealing prospect than... Um, traveling to say far flung further afield places um, BEA really get their marketing going early on 
Hmm. Um, and again, because they have to compete more directly with regular European traffic. So early on, they're aggressively fighting their corner. But BOAC still have this kind of this royal elite symbolism behind them. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd, I have to be honest, I didn't realise that they weren't. So, that, so were they not permitted to fly those routes or was it just not what they did? Okay, as in BOAC competing with BEA. Yeah. Yeah, so it, again, it's, again, there's an, another paper in there somewhere about how BOAC and BEA weren't really keen on each other. Um, and then when the, the Edwards Committee report, which merges the two together, comes out, there's fierce debates over why it shouldn't happen. Um, but there are very, very specific rules and arrangements right. that, okay. that show that BOAC should not compete with BEA and BEA should not compete with BOAC. Yeah. Uh, it, become, well, it was a bit blurry in the early stages because you couldn't get an aircraft all the way out of Europe um, before it needed to land. Yeah. So they'd share a couple of routes and they pooled their profits. But other than that, um, they kind of go their own separate ways, particularly towards this end point. Right. Should we move on to the, because I'm conscious of time, so be, the, the, the final act, shall we say, becoming BA. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I can probably skim over this slide pretty quickly because um, you kind of see what you need to know on it. Um, so they, they, uh, there's a mass campaign behind um, forming, uh, behind the Edwards Committee, which forms um, British Airways, again, deriving from the British Airways Limited that existed in 1939, mm -hmm. really confusingly. Um, and basically they formed together in 1974 to become, or they finally become branded as British Airways, right. but they're formed in 1972. And that effectively ends BOAC. Um, all of their assets become combined with um, BEA. And there's a couple of others. I think they form. Uh, I think they merge later on down the line, down the line with British Caledonian as well. Yeah. Um, they they're still at this stage state owned, um, but very swiftly on Thatcher comes along and uh, upsets that. Um, but that's that's a whole different presentation. Yes, that's a, maybe maybe for another time, eh? Well, there's plenty more transport history to go around, eh? <laughs> um, so remembering BOAC, why why should we remember them? Yeah, so this is um, this was part of their uh, BA100 celebrations. Um, I very proudly proclaim my uh, BA100 pin that I have such acquired. Is, is um, it? Wait a minute. Is it on you now? It is indeed. Yeah, um, there we go. That, very proud of that. <laughs> okay. They are the badges used um, by all staff um, over the last year. Um, and to celebrate uh, BA's birthday, they painted their 747s in old liveries. So you can see on the left there the BOAC 747. Mm -hmm. Again, very, very conflicted memory because BOAC didn't really operate that many 747s and they didn't operate them for that long, um, but company birthdays. Um, and again, the BEA painted um, Airbus as well. Um, it's a fascinating way of remembering the British Overseas Airways Corporation. Um, again, you had on here, um, I believe it was, uh, you had Dr. Sophie on. Dr. Sophie um, Horry, yes, last week. Absolutely, she was talking about um, companies trying to go back to um, you know GWR and London North Eastern Railway they're really harking back to their heritage um, and BA are trying to do exactly the same thing um, but obviously they've put too much effort into the British Airways brand itself um, and there's there are some fabulous adverts that almost identically mimic those of the uh, like appallingly patriotic ad, uh, adverts of the 19. Um, 40s and 50s mm. um, but one of them charts the history of British Airways um, through its inception um, in 19 uh, what is it 19, 1910s all the way up through to its modern day um, and it's interesting to see which eras of BOAC they pick mm. because they go straight from Imperial Airways right to VC-10s and Jet Age 
casually ignoring all of the controversies in between. Yeah. And obviously they skip onto the Concord. Um, uh, and I thought that's a basically that's a fascinating callback to see how the railway companies do it as well. Yeah. Uh, I'll be very interested to see how BOAC proceed or how BA proceed with this. Yeah, it's it's very much constructing a version of the history to project shaped by today's modern understanding. I suppose the the ultimate one of that is British Airways is not a hundred years old or a hundred and one years old. Yeah, it's it's not. It's well, fifth seventy four. Work out the maths, but it's it's trying to claim ownership of that past to show pride it or to project something in the present, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, their choice of birth date um, is really, really quite strange. Um, I don't actually know the reasoning why they chose that date. Um, again, uh, there's, there's definitely research to be done in the use of um, uh, companies and their birthdays, but I would partly suspect that's because of the excellent timing that a birthday celebration would have. Um, the amount of tickets uh, British Airways sold um, purely upon painting these aircraft is ridiculous. Um, I think there's definitely a particularly strong sales angle here more than there is a heritage angle. Yeah, you could you could be quite cynical about it, couldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So let's. So where are we? Ah, oh, we are at the end. Absolutely, and that that's very much a whistle-stop tour um, of BOAC. There's uh, pretty much each one of those slides I could spend about forty-five minutes on alone, but uh, it's not worth everyone's time. Well, um, I mean, but... you know, I'm always on the lookout for talks, so <laughs> maybe we could dig down into some of these issues at some point in the future. I mean, there's there's a lot there to unpack, but you're st of course you're still working through it, aren't you? <laughs> Hopefully the PhD will end at some point uh, and it will come out as a book or something that can be sold on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that might, might not be for very, that might not be for a while. Yeah, well, fingers crossed. So before, fingers crossed. <laughs> before you go, a um, couple of comments, David, uh, says long haul and short haul were two very different products with their own distinct markets at the time it's only in the past 20-30 years that the mass market consumer has the wherewithal to go long haul yeah absolutely absolutely and, and you really do see that in the separation between BEA and BOAC um, obviously we're doing it it's really quite odd in these days where you have like the Dreamliner which does both long and short haul Mm. Um, and you start getting low cost long haul that's a really weird blur um, and it again that, that really is a culture shock for a lot of airlines and it's sending a lot of airlines down yeah and then I mean there's that thing with modern airlines about sort of you can have a designer plane unlike in the past you have a designer plane like 747 but now you have a designer plane that can be lengthened and shortened depending on what you want to use it for yeah yeah absolutely they, they they did I think they they did do that with the Comet Four, oh, really? um, various, various different iterations of the Comet Four um, could be longer or shorter. Yeah. Um, but that's the only one they really emphasise that on. They don't seem to do that with a lot of the others. Okay. Um, let's see if we got any other comments. Uh, BOC effectively had one livery throughout its life. BEA had how many? Do you, perhaps you know? Perhaps you don't. They they had a fair few. Um, they had a real handful. Oh, I, I couldn't possibly name the full amount, but I think we're looking at like six or seven. Right. Um, they certainly had sort of six or seven different logos. Hmm. Um, but again, that that's that's the problem with trying to remain commercial, hmm. and you know, BEA, BEA really do well at this commercial European travel, um, and. BOAC don't do very well at the mass global travel. Right. You can see the efforts are different, and BAA are learning much quicker than BOAC. I suppose that's perhaps because they're a more competitive marketplace, do you think? Or... Yeah, absolutely. And again, they don't have that culture of power. Um, there isn't that pecking order of, air, of um, BOAC, or the, the, the Commonwealth airline yeah. um, that are representing Britain. BEA don't care. BEA care about profit, right. whereas BOAC care about rep. Okay. 
I want this is probably for another time, but I'm wondering, you know, one of the, the questions that, that I've always been interested in is when uh, the big four were formed, how the different companies interacted and within those companies. But I wonder if when BEA and BOAC were merged, how, how did that union go? Did it go well? Did it go badly? Were they, yeah, just don't have to answer if you don't know but it's i was gonna say i wish i had more to say about that all i know is that they absolutely detested each other so right. i i can imagine that there was some real interesting conversations going on um i I'm think sure. a lot of that was government mediated <laughs> cool well thank you so much lewis for that that was as you say a uh, a run through of all the history but really interesting and 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 really to give us an insight into your thesis um thank um, you thank you for having me on as well it's been an absolute pr uh, privilege no worries it's been great to have you on um so before i before we go a uh, couple of things uh so who have we got next time we've got uh dr erin beeston uh erin's coming on and she's uh, going to talk about Liverpool Road Station and reimagining an oldest railway station and she's going to talk about it's it's, it's the oldest station in the world the story is focused and but a lot of the stoke the focus of the station is on the light the light uh, the early years sorry when it was part of, of course the Liverpool Manchester Railway but what about the station's life cycle and she's going to you know going forward it's got a longer history as a freight hub and her talk will shed light on how commemoration of the site influenced its reuse as a museum it's a museum of science and industry uh, so very much touching on themes that Sophie uh, discussed uh, a few weeks uh, ago so um, let me go back so all that remains for me to say is thank you so much Lewis for coming on that was really interesting and thank you everybody for your comments and tuning in again and I hope to see you soon. So farewell. Thank you very much. See you later. See you all.